And this is Ken Kratzer for CBSI Services. Have a chance to visit our good friend Ryan Craver at TrimFit. And Ryan is also the editor of a weekly newsletter, uh, very informative about retail, called the Tech Infused Retailer. And uh, comes out bright and early every Monday morning. I always enjoy it. Ryan, how are you? Doing fantastic. That's Amen. great. Real good, real good. Great mm -hmm. that the weather has turned. And that is something very important to retailers because the shoppers start coming back out to uh, to shop and get and buy all their spring and summer uh, purchases. How do you see the spring sales season going so far? What's a, what's a, what's uh, the hot merchandise this year? Yeah, I, I think for the most part, the retailers that I have spoken to, they are saying that a lot of the traffic is returning. So I think we're going to get over this little hump of having some nice weather, especially on the East Coast, and we're going to start to see some traffic patterns back into the store, hopefully. Um, Initial read is, is I, I think it's going to be a difficult spring overall. It depends. There's going to be some certain pockets of retailers that do very, very well. I think online will continue to do very, very well. The hot stuff is obviously the time for this brand specifically, which was one of the 10 brands that we own or license, is back to school. Um, so they're loading up heavily for back to school. Uh, for online, there's a day called Prime Day, which Amazon runs every year. That should be 2, 3x what it was last year, so it's a big day in the middle of um, July. Um, and I, I think overall the whole athletic category is going to continue to be strong. I think there's a lot more people fighting for that athletic customer, but in general that athletic category is probably going to continue to do very well. Athleisure is probably the better term. Well, I was actually I was very fortunate to be in San Francisco for uh, the Super Bowl this year, and there was a, a partnership of Macy's uh, with the NFL. The Macy's flagship store in downtown San Francisco was uh, just filled with shoppers because, uh, like New as New York did a couple of years ago, they had a, a floor uh, pretty much dedicated to NFL and Super Bowl merchandise that was uh, really attracting a lot of shoppers into the stores. Now is that, and, and I also saw uh, last year in fourth quarter that spectator ticket sales were up 10% mm -hmm. as an industry. Is that important for retailers to affiliate with athletic brands? I think so. Um, you know, obviously the NFL is, is the largest of the major sports in terms of the push for apparel. Um, but what's interesting is you start to look at certain brands and they're driving all of their sales off of a few select hot brands. Like for an example is, is Under Armour. Under Armour is incredibly hot, mainly due to Jordan, not the Jordan you're thinking about from Nike. Uh, also Stephen Curry, although he's, he's now hurt. I have a pair of his uh, basketball shoes. There you go. So it influences a lot of sales. And I think those trends, not only that, but also the more athleisure stuff, like the walkers from um, Skechers, as well as the Nike Freeze, all of those are kind of driving a lot of big sales trends within retailers. That's why Foot Locker, Finish Line, those guys are, are seeing uh, relatively good sales as well as some of the retailers. That's their true uh, pockets of strength. Well, I know you mentioned uh, going down to New Orleans and having a chance to visit at the All Payments right. Expo. Um, and certainly a lot going on um, uh, with uh, mobile payments and, and uh, and uh, also the uh, launch uh, last fall of chip cards. Number one, how, what was your reaction about how the implementation of chip cards that went into in effect last October, how, what are the re retailers saying about the impact? Yeah. The majority, uh, you know, if I think about it from two aspects, the consumer's view of it is completely confused. They don't know when they're supposed to use the chip and pin. They don't know which retailers are enabled for chip and pin. They don't necessarily know if their card is requiring a PIN, because some of them aren't, and that's their first stage of getting over chip and PIN. Um, lines are longer. Uh, lines are a lot longer. People are unhappy about it. Uh, but these things take time. I think it's going to take a lot of time and education for the consumer. Longer term, they're going to figure it out. I mean, countries like Canada, which is uh, just north of us, they have had chip and PIN for quite some time. Europe has had chip and PIN for quite some time. It is worthwhile. Um, when you start to look at it from the retailer's perspective, I think a lot of the associates are confused as well. Um, 
some of the stores have them, some of the stores don't have them. Uh, is the point of sale the exact same across all stores? Not necessarily. So if you have floating uh, associates within bigger stores, sometimes they won't necessarily see the full uh, point of sale upgraded across the entire store. So it's just, it's, it's, it's very confusing for a lot of people, but it takes time. With that said, I think some of the news that we reported uh, probably two weeks ago was Visa's coming out with some changes to make the chip and pin uh, authentication process go a lot quicker. I'm sure MasterCard will follow, Amex will follow, a lot of the other guys will follow. So I think overall it's going to get better. I think longer term is probably better for us as consumers. Okay, and uh, certainly uh, news from some of the uh, larger retailers this spring uh, has been a little bit unsettling. Uh, uh, with Sears, my uh, one-time employer, uh, cutting back stores, Kmart, Aeropostel, and, and uh, why are the re the big traditional retailers with department stores struggling uh, yeah. right now? Yeah, uh, very tough question to answer. I think it's a combination of things. The first thing is is a lot of the the sales, as we've talked about on many of these um, podcasts, is a lot of the sales are moving to digital. Digital platforms inherently are a lot less profitable, so that hurts them. Their bread and butter has always been store sales, so they're seeing negative store sales. That's one. But two, and I think that this is something that doesn't get spoken about a lot, is, is all the brands that these department stores carry, unless they're private label brands that can only be found at a Kohl's or only be found at a Macy's, are going direct to consumer as well. They're opening their own stores. So the ability for me to get a Calvin Klein outfit, the ability for me to get an Under Armour outfit, it's not only in a boatload of retailers, but I can also go to underarmour.com. I can also go to amazon.com and get it. I can go to many different locations to get that same product, including direct to the brand. And when, when customers have a high affinity or loyalty to a certain brand, they're likely to go directly to the brand. Um, not in all cases, but for the most part they will. Uh, so they're getting a lot more of the higher priced merchandise from those um, direct from the brand. And then the third thing is, is the majority of the growth is not going to the traditional locations that you're used to. It's going to Amazon.com. Um, they are picking up a majority of the growth, uh, Amazon and affiliate sites. So it's, it's, it's very difficult for the department stores. I think when we look five years ahead, um, it's going to be interesting to take a look at Sears because Sears is the one that, yes, their sales aren't doing so well, yes, they have high inventory levels, yes, they have high debt, and they're using a lot of their stores to move into real estate and, and monetize through real estate. However, they are the first to say very bluntly, we want to operate a e-commerce site first and foremost supported by stores. And what that does is that tells people that they're gonna close stores, they're gonna make smaller size format stores, and you're gonna see a dramatically different version of what we currently define as a department store. And I think it's inevitable for a majority of the department stores. Well, one of the big uh, changes at Sears a few years ago was when they dropped out of uh, their online, well, their catalog business. They had one of the biggest catalog businesses, the big book, as they called it, going back uh, uh, probably nearly a century. And uh, they decided to drop it. And I wonder if that's premature, if they could have in some way uh, switch that to an online format mm -hmm. instead of saying uh, it just wasn't working because so many other traditional uh, catalog companies have been able to successfully make that switch over uh, to online. You know, you look at the you know the Yellow Beans, uh, for example, uh, or others that have been able to maintain their presence and and, and maintain uh, their business by going online. But is that a struggle for 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 the traditional catalog companies? to make that switch into online? I think it is, uh, but it it's more a struggle for those who are making the decisions based upon where the sales attribution lies. So what the heck does that mean? I think a lot of, and I was part of this process at my old retailers that I worked at, you sit back in these marketing meetings and you say, okay, we spent $100,000 as an example to push this catalog out. How much of the sales came back through that catalog? And what they see is something that's usually underwhelming. Because for them to drive a Google ad or a Facebook ad, they're likely gonna see a much better payback in sales. And so they, they make a short-term decision. We have a cash crunch. We have a budget shortfall. Let's kill the catalog. Let's shrink the size of the catalog. Let's mail it to less people. Um, and 
I think it's a much more difficult conversation than that. I think there are some people that do enjoy reading catalogs. I also think that there are some people that you can only get by sending them catalogs. Um, they're not necessarily going to shop online. I think what's going to be very interesting is, is that the predominant portion of the sales today exists on desktop sites. It's slowly shifting, excuse me, rapidly shifting to mobile. But what's going to be really interesting is, is you're going to start to see the people who truly don't like to shop through mobile. It's either going to force them to the stores or force them to the traditional channels like catalogs and things like that because a lot of people still don't like shopping mobile. Well, on attribution, the Direct Marketing Club of New York had a session on that topic, just what you were uh, talking about um, over the winter uh, in March. And, uh, and one of the big points made was is just a testing. You've got a test to, to identify and set up tests and controls for identifying uh, where the source of revenue and sales is coming from, yeah. you know, which media when you're doing multi-channel. Yeah. Hey, just really quick on that, I think one interesting point, um, some of the, 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 the leading edge retailers, what they're doing is, is they're looking at based on proximity to stores for that customer. So for customers that are close to stores and naturally will be marketed to just by driving by a store or just by mouth, word of mouth, they're going to find out about the store, they may be pulling back on sending catalogs. Whereas those that are in far reaching locations that don't necessarily see a store, can't get into a store, or aren't surfing their site, they may send them a catalog just to bring that brand awareness back into their head and that uh, idea of shopping with them again, which is very interesting. Absolutely. Another event I was at uh, the other night actually in New York, uh, the Data Innovator Award, uh, presented by that same Direct Marketing Club of New York. Um, had a chance to meet Joe Zawatsky, uh, CEO of Media Math, and uh, he was introduced by Charlie Stryker of Venture Development. Uh, two gentlemen have done uh, a lot of work in the area of programmatic technology, programmatic advertising, which I kind of explain as being setting up advertising for Facebook and Google uh, based on, on uh, on the interests uh, that customers have shown. And you've mentioned so much about the importance of, of being having a presence for retailer on, on Amazon.com. Where does it, where is that, that fit as far as uh, the, this growth that we see in numerous companies uh, in the advertising community here in New York City about the growth of program adverti programmatic advertising driving um, the presence of retailers and other advertisers to uh, consumer screens all over the world. Yeah, I I just if if I break it down in, in the most basic form, I just like to go where the eyes are, and where are the eyes for the most part? One in five minutes in the U.S. on a smartphone is spent within a Facebook property, whether it's WhatsApp, whether it's Instagram, whether it's Facebook. So it's absolutely something that you need to advertise on. Google is the most popular search engine, right? Um, Google has the ability to also blend itself into the real world and send mobile push notifications. So you have to be on Google. And then Amazon, if you look at, I probably overused this stat, but 46% of shopping searches start on Amazon.com. So if you aren't a part of that conversation, 46% of shopping searches, you're just not doing your job. Now, I think everyone sits back and they say, Amazon is a huge competitor of ours. I view them more as a Google for the most part because they are that search engine. They are that initial funnel. They are the first way that someone can find out about a brand and what your abilities are to be a brand. So I don't think it's so simple as binary to say, yes, I'm on Amazon or no, I'm not on Amazon. If you're not on Amazon, your products, I guarantee, are on Amazon through a third party and you need to control that. If you are willing to be on Amazon, you can do it in a number of ways. You can control what catalog you give them. You can control the exclusivity of the products. So you can do a lot of things to make sure that you are part of the conversation. And I just think that if you're not part of the largest retailer, soon to be largest apparel retailer in the world, with the highest customer service satisfaction ratings and the most extensive fulfillment network, you're doing yourself a disservice. We're talking with Ryan Craver of Trimfit. Now, Ryan, you got to tell us about all your uh, spring and summer merchandise. I see some of it here yeah. at your showroom in New York. and. Uh, Tell us about it and uh, where can people uh, find it? Absolutely. So this brand specifically is a trim fit brand. It's our children's wear brand. We've owned it for about two years. Uh, it's distributed exclusively um, in Kohl's, Amazon, Macy's, 
Costco Canada stage stores. Um, we've got a bunch of new underwear, we've got a bunch of new footwear, we've got bras, we've got socks and hosiery. Brandy's been around since 1921, coming up on 100 years uh, very, very soon, so we need to do something big. You also can check everything out on TrimFit.com. This is one of the brands we own. We've got another three or four showrooms that we've got some of the other brands. We've got a New Balance license. We've got a Joe Fresh license. So we've got lots of apparel. We've got lots to sell you. Well, that's neat. And Ryan Craver, just want to wish you the best on your uh, wedding, uh, actually this uh, weekend coming up. And uh, our best wishes for health and happiness. Appreciate it. Thank you. Good to see you again. Always a pleasure. Ryan Craver of TrimFit here in New York City. This is Ken Kratzer for CBSI Services.